Welcome back, history students. All right, we're going to continue with the home front, how World War II affected the home front. Last lecture, I mentioned many changes for American women. Today, we're going to start with changes for African Americans. And you will see some similarities between women's experiences during the war and African Americans. There are new opportunities for both groups that really didn't exist as much before the war. All right, so I'll start with military service. Before I go into this topic, I just want to mention something that often confuses some students. This is not the first war that we had African American soldiers. The U.S. has used African American soldiers for many years before World War II. There were African American soldiers who fought for the North in the Civil War. So this is not the first war where we, the U.S. government used black soldiers. However, there was a new opportunity for African American men in the U.S. military during World War II. And that opportunity was to become combat pilots. Now, as I mentioned in our last video, women could join the Air Force as pilots. Remember the WASPs? However, they were not allowed to fly combat units. But during World War II, there was a new opportunity for black pilots to fly combat missions. And this was the first war that we had African-American men fly combat missions. And the famous squadron of black pilots is the 99th Pursuit Squadron, also known as the Tuskegee Airmen. I have a couple photos to show you, so let's look at those. This is a photo from the 1940s, 1945. This is the members of the Tuskegee Airmen, 332nd Fighter Group. And this is a photograph of eight Tuskegee Airmen in front of a fighter jet during World War II. The reason that the 99th Pursuit Squadron became so famous is because they were highly decorated pilots. And what I mean by that is they earned many medals for bravery in battle. The 99th Pursuit Squadron earned 80 Distinguished Flying Cross medals during the war, which is a very, very high honor for bravery in battle. There were people in the military at this time who did not believe that African Americans could be effective pilots combat pilots. And the Tuskegee Airmen proved them wrong. African American pilots were equal to any other pilot that the U.S. military used. The opportunity to become a combat pilot was a new opportunity for African American men in World War II. But again, we already had African American soldiers before World War II. Now, the other thing I would like to mention is that our military was segregated. We're going to be talking a lot about segregation in this course. In World War II, our military was still segregated. It had soldiers served in squadrons or regiments of soldiers with people of their same racial background, even other races. Um, I'm going to talk about the Japanese Americans at the end of this segment. We're probably not going to get to it today in this video. When Japanese American men were allowed to re-enlist in the military in the middle of the war, they also served seg separately from other groups. So your race determined your, you know, how you were segregated within the military. It's not until the 1950s that the U.S. military became integrated 
And the Korean War, which we're going to cover later on this semester, is the first US war where we had an integrated military. But in World War II, you served with people of your similar racial background. I would like to talk about the civil rights movement. And we're going to be talking a lot about the civil rights movement in this course. When we get to the 1950s, I'm going to give you a big history on the modern civil rights movement. Um, but one of the things I'm going to be highlighting is that the civil rights movement doesn't start in the 1950s with Dr. King and Rosa Parks. A lot of students think that's the beginning of civil rights, right? Dr. King started it all in the 50s and 60s and Rosa Parks, that was the beginning. That's actually the middle of the modern civil rights movement. The modern civil rights movement really begins earlier than that, the late 1800s, early 1900s, which again, I'm going to go into in more detail in a later video. So there was a civil rights movement during World War II in the 1940s. There already was a civil rights movement. Now, one group that existed, civil rights group that existed during World War II was called CORE, and it's an acronym. It stands for Congress on Racial Equality. Congress on Racial Equality. That was a civil rights group formed in the early 1940s. And CORE hoped that the US government would be willing to protect African American rights, especially during World War II. One of the leaders of CORE, and a civil, early civil rights leader, during this time was a man named A. Philip Randolph. This is a painting by Betsy Graves Raynell of A. Philip Randolph. So A. Philip Randolph and the leaders of CORE wanted the U.S. government to enforce fair employment for African Americans in the defense industry. Now, remember, A. Philip Randolph met with FDR, our president, and he asked the president to force employers in the defense industry to open up jobs for African Americans and allow for pay without discrimination. At the time, black workers were paid less than white workers for the same work. There was not equal pay laws yet. Similarly, women were not paid equally to men for the same work. So there were no laws that protected African Americans, Hispanic Americans, women in employment to be treated equally. So FDR at first, kind of stalled. And the way that, the reason that he changed his mind is A. Philip Randolph told the president that he and CORE were going to organize a march on Washington to bring attention to the fact that African Americans were not paid equally in the defense industries. No, that discussion pushed FDR to issue an executive order number 8802. So President FDR issued an executive order number 8802 that prohibited discrimination in the defense industry based on race and created a Fair Employment Practices Commission to investigate complaints of discrimination in the, the defense industry. So that executive order was a win for civil rights because it it was the, a federal decision. Now, again, I'll go into an executive order in a minute. <clears throat> it was a decision to prohibit discrimination in the defense industry and investigate discrimination complaints. The government was going to investigate discrimination complaints. Now, why did FDR issue the, this executive order? FDR does not want to march on Washington in 1941. 
when there's a world war and the country, our country might be at risk, that's not a good time to have civil unrest. You know, FDR knew that if we entered the war, we were going to need to be unified as a country to win the war. That's why FDR issued the executive order number 8802. Now, I always tell my students that was a victory for civil rights, but it was a short-lived victory. And I always ask students why. Of course, I can't hear your answers now. That it was a short-lived victory because it only impacted the defense industry. It did not affect the civilian industries. So African Americans that worked in private, the private sector were not guaranteed equality under this executive order. Only African Americans that worked in the, in the defense industry. So that's the first reason why it was not that effective. But the other reason is, after the war ends, there will no longer be a defense industry. So what happens to equality in employment? It goes away when World War II ends. So the civil rights movement needs to continue well past World War II. There need to be better laws that guarantee equality and employment. And this executive order is not good enough to do that. Before I move on, I just want to mention what an executive order is very quickly. Now, I know that uh, our pr current president has issued many executive orders, so you might be familiar with them. An executive order is a decision that the president makes that he doesn't need to ask Congress for permission. And it usually has to do with, it could do with civil rights, it could do with national defense. And the idea behind an executive order is that it is uh, an issue that needs a decision quickly, and the president doesn't want to wait for Congress to vote. Now, of course, any executive order can be interpreted by the U.S. Supreme Court and overturned. So the president is not a dictator who can just issue a hundred executive orders and just ignore Congress and forget about checks and balances. That's does not how it works. Yes, the president can issue executive orders. Any executive order that the, the president creates can be examined by the Supreme Court and can be overturned by the U.S. Supreme Court. So that's how the Supreme Court, one of the ways they check the power of the president. So that's what an executive order is, just in case you didn't know what that meant. All right, I'm going to mention labor unions now. And this is also something that's going to be affecting women. There were labor unions, major labor unions, that opened up their membership to new members for the first time. African Americans, women were able to join some of the big labor groups, labor unions, for the first time during World War II. So I'm talking about the big labor unions, like the United Rubber Workers, the United Steel Workers, the United Auto Workers. And the reason for, and this is going to affect women too, more women were able to join the labor, these big labor unions. And the reason for that is there are more minority workers, like African Americans, and women working as what we call skilled workers during World War II. Before World War II, skilled work was mostly reserved for white men. Now, when I mention skilled work, you might wonder, what's skilled work? Skilled work is something like welding, riveting, where you need a skill to do the job. Shoveling ditches in the street, anyone can do that. That's an unskilled job. But learning how to weld takes a skill. And the skilled jobs were reserved for white men. And African Americans would not be hired as welders. Women would not be hired as welders. It would be very rare. After the U.S. entered World War II and a lot of men left to fight the war, there was a need for more skilled workers. We need supplies to win the war. We need welders. We need riveters because we have to build a lot of equipment to win the war. And there were not enough white men to fill those jobs. So we end up getting women. We end up getting minority workers who 
learn skills and become these skilled workers. Now you might wonder, well, how do you learn to be a welder? I mean, that's not like a, a job that you can just pick up off the street and just learn one day. The US government set up free schools for women, minority groups, to learn things like riveting and welding. So if you wanted to work as a welder or a riveter and get a war job, all you had to do was go to the free school and the government was encouraging people. They were making up films. They were putting up advertisements. You know, go learn, get a war job. Go to the free government school. Go learn how to be a welder. We need you. Uncle Sam needs you. We have to win the war. And so a lot of African Americans um, and Hispanic Americans and women learn to be riveters and welders. They're now skilled workers. And guess what? They're eligible to join the big labor unions now. They can join the United Iron Workers and the United Steel Workers and the United Auto Workers. And they do. So we're going to see union membership go up, which I'm going to cover under economic changes. So that's a change not only for African Americans, but also for women, was the uh, joining labor unions. Migration, this is something also that affected women and minority workers. Many, many people moved to where the jobs were. So a lot of people left the rural areas and moved to cities where they could get a job in an aircraft plant or making missiles or you know getting a job in a, in a def defense industry. Now for African Americans, we have a lot of African Americans moving from the south to the north where a lot of jobs are. So that's where we see a lot of migration of African Americans. There's more movement from south to north. So that affects women and African Americans. Now, with a lot of migration of African Americans and Hispanic Americans, I'm going to get to that also, we have a rise of racial tension in the U.S. cities during World War II. Now, it's a little different depending on what coast you're looking at. If you look at the East Coast, right, where New York is and Boston and Philadelphia and all those northeast cities. There is tension in the northeast between African Americans and whites. There are a lot of African Americans who left the southeast and moved to the northeast. And so that's where we see a lot of change in demography and population in the northeast, which led to racial tensions. Now, if we, let's take the West Coast. On the West Coast, in cities like Los Angeles, we see a migration of many Hispanic workers. That racial tension happened because of a rapid change of population in urban areas. A little statistic, I'm never going to ask you this again, just for your knowledge. In the summer of 1943, in 47 American cities, there were over 250 racial conflicts. That's in one summer. So there were many often fights that would break out between people over race because of this change in demography in urban areas. I'll give you an example of one of the more devastating riots that happened during World War II. In Los Angeles in 1943, there was a race riot called the Zoot Suit Riot. I'm going to put it on the outline. In L.A. The Zoot Suit Riot be began because there was a lot of tension between the white population and the Mexican population in Los Angeles. And we end up having a white mob a lot of whom were sailors, went into to Mexican-American neighborhoods and were going to attack the zoot suiters. So you might not know what a zoot suit is. A zoot suit was a popular suit, I think, in the 1930s. It's a suit that men wore with a very long jacket and big shoulder pads. It was popular in the 30s. In the 1940s, it became a very popular suit to wear for young Mexican-American men. And so a lot uh, in this zoot suit riot, we have a white mob of people looking to beat up the zoot suiters, and it became known as the zoot suit riot. The reason that this riot was devastating in Los Angeles is because it lasted for many days. And 
many people were hurt and then LAPD looked the other way and really did not stop the riot and let it go on for several days. So that was one of the worst race riots that we had in this country during World War II. And again, that was the result of rapid change in population, led to racial tension. Changes in the American family. During World War II, we see changes in the American family. Number one, we see more people getting married during World War II. There's a couple reasons for this. The period of time before World War II was the Great Depression. We already discussed that in our first video. During the Great Depression, many people put off marriage because they were unemployed or they had hard lives because of the Depression, and they didn't want to, it wasn't a good time to get married. When world, we entered World War II, the economy is going to improve. I'm going to get to that when we get to economic changes. And people can afford to get married now. So that's one of the reasons why marriage rises. The other reason is a lot of young men are going off to fight. Many of them want to marry their sweetheart before they go off to fight so that she doesn't leave or go with somebody else. And so a lot of mar people got married before their loved one went off to fight the war. We also see the birth rate start to rise during World War II. Now, it's not the baby boom yet. However, we do see an uptick of births. Both of my parents were born during World War II. So there is an increase. A lot of people who had put off having babies during the Great Depression because they couldn't afford to feed another mouth. Well, during World War II, guess what? There was jobs. People were doing better financially, and they could afford children. And the other issue is there are couples whose husbands were going off to fight in the war, and the husband wanted to have a child before he left so that his name would go on. If he didn't come back from the war, at least his family would have his son or his daughter to kind of take on the name. Now, the other thing we see with family is the rise of divorce. You know, obviously, if there's more marriages, there's going to be more, more divorce. Now, I'm not talking about the divorce rate we have today. It wasn't that high. Divorce back in the 1940s was not as accepted as it is today. So today, when people get divorced, I don't think we think it's that big of a deal. Many people get divorced. It's not a scandal. It's not anything that we even think twice about, really. But back in the 1940s and before the 40s, divorce was considered controversial and, you know, was something that people tried to avoid at all cost. However, there are people who got married quickly during World War II and probably realized, oh, I got married too quickly and I really don't want to be married. And so we do see an uptick of divorce, although it's nowhere near the level of modern day America. All right, next video, we're going to look at political changes in our country and economic changes. And then we'll probably cover the internment camps of the Japanese Americans. So I'll see you in the next video.